volunteered this week to talk a little bit about my experiences using the science of learning in schools um, and things that worked for me based on the science of, of learning um, and some things that I, I've tried previously that don't align with that and haven't worked for me. Just a little bit about myself. I took the position at the start of the year. I was very excited to take the role of General Manager of Learning Degrees Australia because I really believe on, in what we're doing and um, the potential for us as an organisation to uh, help affect the lives of students across Australia if we can um, promote our, our agenda, which is absolutely the right agenda. Also Executive Director for the last four years of CogLearn, which is my own consultancy business. Um, high point in terms of recognition was being asked to be a Gonski 2 panellist uh, for myself. Um, I don't agree with everything in the report uh, and I wasn't responsible for everything in the report, but it was a, a very interesting process to go through. I've also worked for Good to Great Schools, Noel Pearson. Um, so I've been into a lot of schools. I think I've been principal of nine or ten schools over the years. And I'm also currently a director of two um, independent schools in Queensland. So to, tonight, I am going to be very um, touching on a lot of things very briefly. So I'm not going into a lot of depth. The length of the session doesn't allow for that. Uh, and I do expect with the audience that a lot of you will be very familiar with a lot of the things that I'm speaking about. Uh, otherwise, there certainly is information and links for you to go and follow up and learn in far more depth and far more detail. Uh, so that, that's what I'm essentially going to talk about. Uh, that's the overview there. Um, and just a little bit more, I, I really joined LDA because of um, what I'd found to be very successful in a school. Uh, the school that I was in was Broadbeach State School. You can look up their results um, in the My School website, uh, particularly from about 2015 onwards. Um, we achieved amazing results and that was because I learned a whole lot of wonderful things off uh, other principals, uh, other educators, and also through doing a uh, honours degree in psychology, um, which I completed in 2016. But also had lots of failures. I was 20 odd years, 21 years as a principal of school. So I went through lots of ups and downs with that as well. Um, and I think there is an obvious pathway to school success. Unfortunately, it's unknown the most, ignored by some and adopted by a few. Um, that's my take on it. Patty talks about great teaching being the key. Um, can't affect the students. We can't affect what they're born with and, and so on and so forth. But the 30% of teach, what the teacher can impart is certainly of great value and something that we can uh, impart on students. So how do we get great teaching? Well, I, I think they're the three things, uh, all equally important. Um, and I'll be touching on those throughout the presentation tonight. So one of the things that we really focused on, and I was made aware of cognitive load theory, I think I came back from working in Singapore uh, in 2008, and I read an article in the Education Week magazine, that, a small article about John Sweller talking about how to problem solve, how we're teaching problem solving in mathematics the wrong way around. And it really struck me, and um, this was prior to me going and doing a psychology degree, um, but I've been a fan of cognitive load theory ever since. And when we were choosing programs and instructional approaches at my school, that was very much um, the forefront of, of what we were doing. Um, in, obviously involved in cognitive load theory is attentional control, and it's all about memory. Uh, I'll also touch on the science of reading the big five, and there's far more qualified people um, that have already and will um, present on the science of reading in these webinars. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about what I've learned over that time. And the last part I'm not going to talk about other than to say that um, a great quote um, from a friend of mine who I learned a lot, a lot of as a principal uh, when he was asked about, you know, is, is this fun in his school? And his school were getting amazing results. If you want to look it up, it's a school called Yorkies Knob. 
uh, north of Cairns. And um, that's what he said, success is the fun we offer. Um, so it wasn't all about trying to have fun for fun's sake, but certainly by achieving success and learning, students were having a great deal of fun at his school and, and at my school. Um, if you're not aware of cognitive load theory, uh, it does talk about those points there and um, it's well worth looking up. Uh, if you Google John Sweller, uh, Paul Kirshner, um, various other people along with those, it's certainly something that Dylan Williams has said should be a core prerequisite of all um, initial teacher education uh, across the world. And yet it's, it's routinely ignored, unfortunately. So some of the stats on attention, and that's something that I'm really interested in um, because without attention, without attention or control, you cannot have learning. If you've been listening to me for the last eight minutes, chances are 40% of you, have, your minds have wandered. Um, some may have wandered more, more of that time than others. Some of you might be hungry thinking about dinner, um, what you've got to do later on. You might be distracted by something else. So if I gave you a quiz on the last couple of slides, it would be interesting to see how you would go. Now I'm going to try this link. I don't know if it will work. If it doesn't, that's okay. If you know about this, that's all right as well. This is promising. This is an awareness. All right. I don't think it worked. So that was a road safety ad in the UK. Um, lots of research on that. And now I'm going to struggle to get back to my presentation, unfortunately. We couldn't hear anything, Michael. Ah. We didn't see anything. You didn't see anything? No, no, we couldn't see anything. Okay, so that was all a waste of time. I'm really You're sorry. You're still on presentation. I could see it. And I could see it, and now I've got YouTube going on my computer. Ah, okay, I could see it and hear it, so I thought you could as well. No, oh, that's disappointing. It says host disabled attention screen sharing. Right, well, that's something for me to, to know about next time. Um, Okie doke. So what can you see now? Nothing. We only see your slide of attentional control. That's, oh, well, that's a good thing because I can't see it. <laughs> yeah, but what it means, Michael, is that that's the one you're sharing. So what you're sharing is your PowerPoint presentation. So yeah, if, yeah. if you click on it and stop sharing and then share the YouTube thing, we'll probably be able to see it. You'll probably get it. Okay, so if I stop sharing this one. Stop share. Stop share. Yeah. Okay. We are going to share. Lynn, we've got you on there now. Share. Share. Yeah. And then YouTube. Ah. And then share. As you can see, I'm a whiz at Zoom. And you need to play it from the beginning. I, I um, there you go. But I need to get back to the one I was on before. Is it there? No? Yes. Okay, so if you watch this, it's a bit of fun. Let's see if it comes up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
What are you monkey doing in there? What about the bear? <laughs> Faye, you're not supposed to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got past 10. <laughs> oh, it's a gorilla. Share your screen now. Okay, we're back. Yep, we're back. Okay. Michael? Oh, hi. Michael? Can you hear me? Yes, I can, but I can hear YouTube as well. Yeah, do you want if do you want to make me co-host and I'll help a bit <laughs> if you don't have um, someone co-host? I do, but um. Yeah. I've put the so, tap on the Where's your PowerPoint? There it is. Yeah, the PowerPoint's up though. So, where's your share screen? I've already shared it. The PowerPoint's up, but the noise is coming from YouTube behind it. It's still going. So did you turn it up? I couldn't. We can't hear your YouTube here. Ah, uh, good. No, stop that. I want to get rid of that, please. Okay. We're nearly right. Okay, can we see the, am I back on? <laughs> yes, your whole, your whole screen is being shared now. Also with the side panels of your PowerPoint. Wonderful. Make it big. Okay, alrighty. That's good. One of my enemies in life is um, technology, unfortunately. And uh, that's very difficult in this world of Zoom and um, working from home and so on. Anyway, the point of, of all of that was how, how many of you, and I, I can't, I don't know, but how many of you have seen that before? If you haven't, how many of you did see um, the gorilla or the bear, whatever it was in, in that one? There lots of variations of that. Point of the story is the last dot point there that students don't pay attention about half the time. It's a very hard thing to research um, to get a, a exact figures on, but that seems to be um, well regarded as, as a, an approximation. That has huge implications for a teacher in a classroom or anybody who's trying to get a student to learn, whether you be a teacher, tutor, speech pathologists or whoever. Um, so some of the things that I've seen work and first, the first and foremost, I guess, is learning space design. Um, there's a lot of fads in, in this space in terms of uh, how a room should look, a, a lot of great looking furniture um, and a lot of theories around let's put students together so that they can all learn to be great collaborators and so on and so forth. However, if we're trying to explicitly teach something, we want to minimise distractions and increase attentional control. So having the student um, learning design, and usually that would be um, in, in a row format or something similar to make it as easy as possible for a student to attend 
that's obviously not enough. Teachers need cues um, for what they're doing. Uh, we need to avoid distractions and that's both within a classroom in a school, but also external uh, distractions that, that often impede. There's schools that I've been in, we had to ban PA announcements. A lot of well-meaning administrators in the office would like to um, send what they believe were important and most probably were notices um, on a daily basis. Um, but what that was doing to the learning was, was quite a lot of distraction and having protocols for learning so that students know what to expect. And there are a lot of great explicit instruction examples and direct instruction examples of those. I want to make a point that it's not dressing up. It's not um, the wow factor. Uh, I once thought that uh, naively about 10 years in as a principal, I thought I'd found the, the holy grail, which was to engage kids by getting staff to, to design lessons that were really exciting and, and out of this world and come in dressed up as somebody or, or something of the, the like. But that really doesn't increase learning. In fact, sometimes it can impede learning as a distraction um, and sets up an unrealistic expectation. But unfortunately, th there's a lot in education that does promote that, that style of thing. Um, so there's a great book, get it off my shelf somewhere. Here we go. Um, great book here. Many of you would have seen it, I would, I would think. And I'll, that's on a screen um, soon as well. Um, that, that goes over um, those six parts. But well, I want to make the point there that it's not an add-on. Memory isn't something that we do in addition to what we normally do as a teacher in a classroom, it's fundamental. If you, and I know this is a slightly contentious point, maybe, but I think if you, if you can't um, remember something, if it's not lodged in your memory, I would say that you don't know it, therefore you haven't learned it or you've forgotten it, and therefore you still don't know it. So um, I think some schools, try and address memory they do things like warm-ups which I, i'm not against and i think there's a um that's a good start uh, so they might do a warm-up at the beginning of a, a maths lesson for example um but that's to me only going um a, a very small way into the power of understanding how memory um can and needs to be embedded in what you do in terms of how the curriculum is designed uh, spaced interleaved and so on uh, the dual coding that that's necessary uh, and certainly retrieval practice and using retrieval practice grids and things like that uh, and just the, the point around space practice as one example out of those six you know I've got a daughter going for a license fees this week I'm sure that she'd be much better served from um, eight uh, half hour lessons rather than one four hour lesson. Um, so th that seems obvious when we talk about someone doing a driving test and learning the skills for driving. Um, however, with curriculum design, it doesn't seem to translate often. So we'll see a, a, whole, a lot of blocked practice um, and then teachers being quite um, annoyed when uh, they go back to that concept several months later and they feel like they're starting from scratch. Well, essentially, often they are. And I gave this presentation the other day in a school and I did have a few battles in the, around the, um, the uh, thing in red there um, around the balanced literacy or the three queuing because they said that they're, their um, education district was still promoting that and therefore um, it must still be quite relevant. So th there's, a, there's a lot of battles, as Emily Hanford spoke about a couple of weeks ago, still a lot of battles to be had in, in this area. Um, I think most people signing into this today would be aware of the science of reading. Um, there's some of the resources that I've used. Um, there's a couple of others, I guess, but... I thought they fitted nicely on the page. And um, again, many of you would, would be aware of these. Um, 
bear in mind this will go up, this presentation will go up on our YouTube page uh, in the next couple of days. So you don't need to, to write them down if, if you don't know of them now. Um, but you're most welcome to. And they're all saying variations on, on the similar things, but I, I think uh, there is much to learn from each of those books in terms of what we can do better in classrooms and uh, certainly um, they've opened my eyes a, a lot and my teacher's eyes a lot uh, to, to what's possible. Science of reading, again, many of you will be familiar with uh, many of these uh, books and so on and so forth and the two websites, Five from Five and the Reading League, um, which have some wonderful uh, things on their sites and um, well worth following. So essentially in my school, the two things that I really, um, I guess, emphasised the most was efficiency and effectiveness. Um, as Hattie says, most things can be effective in a, uh, most things can work in a school. It's, it's a matter of choosing which things are the most efficient and most effective because the biggest enemy is in the middle there that, that teachers will talk about in a school. They'll say they don't have time. They don't have time to teach times tables. I remember being uh, a teacher who used to say, you've got to do that for homework. We don't have time to do that in the classroom. Um, back in the 90s, uh, I remember doing that. And certainly a, a lot of things um, get lip service paid or a box ticked because of the pressure of time. So it is a very limited resource. Therefore, choosing wisely what we do and how we do it, I think, is extraordinarily difficult. As a principal, uh, the inclination was obviously my first battle to get a whole staff of 50-odd teachers to change what they were doing when we weren't in crisis and there wasn't a compelling why. I had to create a compelling why through a, an improvement culture. And that tightrope around asking and telling as a, as a leader in a school is incredibly difficult uh, and incredibly important. And sometimes you get those wrong and you tell when you should ask and sometimes you ask when you should have told. So experience is a great teacher in that. Um, but the other point, of course, is, you know, Taylor and Fisk talked about cognitive misers, and I think it's a great term because it basically means that most of us human beings, we are innately um, mentally lazy. We will usually take the easiest route. We will go back to what's comfortable. So if we're talking about a teacher who has had a practice that's worked for a, a long period of time to an extent that they're comfortable with, their inclination to try something new and then potentially go through an implementation dip uh, is quite limited. Same with students. So the idea that, that, that young children are innately curious and will just learn everything through discovery and inquiry because that's what kids do isn't quite right. If you've ever read to your, a young child um, at, in the evening, um, mm. they will often go back to the same book that you've already read a hundred times because they're quite comfortable with that. They may not want to read something else. So there are some real limitations, I think, to, to that assumption that um, students will just learn through discovery um, or that teachers will just, because they're, they're wonderful people, will just automatically want to take on something new because um, I tell them as the principal or because I show them a book that has some, some terrific research in it. Um, so there's some real um, obstacles to overcome. And obviously skill is the next thing. You can have wonderful teachers, but they don't know what they don't know. So um, having the training and coaching, as I mentioned at the beginning, that allows them to in improve their skill is, is incredibly important. And I always, I like sport and I would often use analogies uh, sport related in terms of that particular coaching. Um, two things on ensuring effectiveness. Must be evidence-based, but that's not enough. There's a lot of evidence-based programs. I saw this working um, with Noel Pearson, going around to schools, and you may have been aware of the report that, uh, or that um, article that, that talked about uh, 
the program, um, the remote literacy scheme that, that we worked with, schools were essentially using direct instruction uh, or explicit instruction um, in remote parts of WA, Northern Territory and Queensland. And some of those schools got amazing results because they use those approaches and those programs with fidelity. They were trained well, they committed, and they delivered it really, really well. Other schools, because the schools were basically told they had to do it. So some schools didn't want to do it. And that showed um, incredibly in their performance uh, and the lack of fidelity. And a, a poorly done program in, in my eyes is, or a poorly done approach is still um, poor education, no matter what, no matter how good the program is. So I think they're the, they're the two keys. Um, I was asked to talk at the school I was at the other day about foundations and, and working memory being the key. I talked about timetabling, because time's an issue, repetition, going over things enough times, the science of reading, some daily writing and some of the stuff that Lynn talked about the other day and the importance of maths, facts and basics. So um, on explicit instruction, I think it, it's a, if I was God and I was able to change the world, I would change explicit instruction as a term because it's such a big umbrella term. It could mean lecturing. It could mean chalk and talk. And I guess when those of us in the know talk about it, we're talking about um, an approach that has high student interaction uh, and that has all of those elements of the science of learning embedded in it. And that is great explicit instruction, but I think equally there's really poor teaching and education that could also be termed, termed explicit instruction. I think that's a, a real issue uh, for us. So uh, often when I get criticism around explicit instruction, people say, well, that's boring. The kids are just sit sitting there um, switching off and getting bored. Well, that, that's not what I'm talking about, but I understand why people who don't know any better uh, could lump them all in, t in the same term. I say it's the highest yield. We're limited with time in schools. And I think in most instances, explicit instruction is the way to go. Um, Hattie obviously gives it a big tick. Uh, the, the thing up the top there is a McKinsey report, how the world's most improved school systems keep getting better. And you can look there, it's a great report. Um, and that talks about the sweet spot, spot between explicit instruction and inquiry learning. And for those who aren't aware, there's a lot on our website, on LDA's website around project follow through and direct instruction. Um, the largest education study ever conducted in the world, billions of dollars spent. And in the end, everybody wants to forget about it or discredit it, um, which to me is incredibly uh, disheartening, I guess. So some of the great books that I, I think around, and I, I've included direct instruction in this with explicit instruction as an uh, under that big umbrella. And I know there's some semantics around that, um, but certainly the work of Engelman, if you're not familiar with um, Engelman's work, that book, Clear Teaching, the third book along there uh, in orange by Shep Barbash. He's a, Shep Barbash is actually a journalist so he writes, it's a very engaging read. I think I read the whole book on a plane back from Cairns. And it really talks through um, the origins of direct instruction, the importance of it and, and the fundamental basis of it. It's certainly not an academic read. Uh, most of Zig Engelman's books on the other hand are incredibly difficult to read. I have a couple on my shelves behind me. Um, and, and I wouldn't recommend in the same way as, as Shep's book. If you are interested in learning more about direct instruction, um, as I was, and I was fortunate enough to meet Zig over in the States and go to the conference, 
the other two books at the time were that really impacted on the schools that I've worked in in a positive way were Archer and Hughes's book and Hollingsworth and Yabara's. And Tom Sherrington's come along with a book based on Rosenshine's principles, which is fantastic as well. Um, but I'd have to say that probably the, the, the best programs or the best approach has been for me, and it's quite controversial, is the direct instruction approaches by Engelman. Um, one of the things Barbash talks about in that book is uh, would, would you um, ask the engineer of the plane to pilot the plane? And he uses that analogy uh, around we're asking teachers to design a course of instruction um, where most teachers have had very little to no formal training on designing instruction um, at university or, or elsewhere. So I, I think it's, it's the most carefully thought through and when done well, as, as I've seen in, in schools um, all over Australia, and including my school, the results were beyond, um, beyond phenomenal and uh, the teachers would never go back once they started. Getting them there is a different story and um, a bit more of a battle. Um, but once they, they see how good it is done well, uh, it, there's no turning back from there. Okay, what have we got next? Oh, yeah. My screen has, all right. But not always. Um, in cognitive load theory, they talk about, and the E's gone from this, I'm really sorry, but it's the expertise reversal effect. Um, and basically the, the premise there and the research there talks about um, people who are experts sometimes learn better through an open-ended or an inquiry uh, or a discovery based approach rather than, than explicit teaching. So uh, in a school, we always looked at the who, what, when and why. We wanted to know the students and, and what their needs were. And for some, in, in some instances, um, we would not go with an explicit instruction approach. Uh, we would go with uh, a discovery or an inquiry approach. And the McKinsey article talks a little bit more about that, if, if you want to go further on that. There are some of the things that I think are low yield in a school. Um, and I'm a little controversial there. I hope Ken hasn't signed in um, to this. I hope nobody's a fan of Ken that I'm offending terribly. Um, please don't abuse me if you are. Um, that, views of my own on that one. It's funny, I, I was doing this the other day at my computer and I looked at my phone, I had a, um, a LinkedIn request and it was Ken Robbins. But when I just saw it and I just typed this up and <laughs> I almost felt like I thought it was Ken Robinson. I thought is he, somehow has he just seen me do this through some weird computer thing. But uh, anyway, I think they're low yield doesn't mean none of them uh, work ever and or that they're not well so i think some of them don't perceptual motor programs i think have been shown not to um and you know computers i i'm, I'm putting computers up there not because i well you can see i'm not great with computers but they have a place but when we think about the the, the yield in terms of the amount of first of all money spent on computers in schools um and it's billions and billions of dollars as opposed to to what they have um, led to, I would consider that they're certainly a, a low yield. And 22nd century, I haven't put that in there just for a laugh. There, there is 22nd century learning. Um, you can Google it, and it's 21st century plus. So um, I'm waiting for 23rd century as well. Um, very. I'll, I'll skip over this fairly briefly, but coaching is so important in schools. I don't think most schools do it well. I don't think most schools do enough of it. Roger Federer wouldn't, and he said this would not have been the tennis player he was without Peter Carter, um, who, who taught him the fundamentals. He was, he was an Australian coach. And if the best tennis player probably that's ever lived, arguably, um, needs a coach, then surely our teachers need a coach or they need good coaching. So 
it needs to be expert. They, they, there's a lot of coaching, I call it coaching light, where um, it, it's not specific enough. It's not focused on a performance agenda. Um, and sometimes it doesn't even involve experts giving the coaching. So I, I think that's really key. And when we talk about students needing automaticity for their learning, it's just as important for teachers, educators to have automaticity in their instruction. And so that's, that's something that a, a great teacher can then fall back on because they will fall back onto whatever's automatic at the time. So um, automaticity of really um, effective uh, practices is, is so important. And that only comes again through repetition uh, like everything else. So, I sent a lot of my teachers to Cairns when I was on the Gold Coast um, to learn from some schools up there that were doing it really, really well. And um, when we developed our own great people, then uh, we could have internal coaching going on. Um, and I'd always start with my best teachers um, and, and really try and develop their skills even more. So we know that there's some real challenges with coaching. Um, you know, there's confirmation bias particularly uh, and so many of, I, I hate um, student teachers or beginning teachers being asked about their philosophy of learning, a philosophy of education and I think, I don't care, it doesn't, I don't care about your opinion on learning, let's go with some facts, but certainly in, in our schools of education, most of our universities um, drum that into into students and a lot of the theories that, that they are peddled in those universities do lack any scientific evidence or worse fly in the face of it so there's a lot of challenges with coaching um, in terms of leadership and management i think you need to be a transformational leader if you don't know much about that that's an alveolo um, it's one of the main um, theories of leadership full range of leadership um, and basically that's inspiring people to want to follow you if you can't get that you won't get change in the school if you want teachers to change what they do they need to be able to follow the leader of the school and the leaders of the school the leadership team um, so you do need to be a transformational leader i've put that in there because there's been a lot of debate lately in leadership circles around instructional leadership being so important well i believe instructional leadership is equally as important but it's not an either or it's not a dichotomy between instructional and transformational they're both important um, and i think i would have characterized myself up until 2014 certainly as a transformational leader i'd been a principal 15 odd years at the time i was not an instructional leader until i started doing my site course still i until i started um, reading the right things and um, going to some schools where true instructional leadership was happening, I wasn't an instructional leader. And when I became an instructional leader, uh, lo and behold, we went to the next level in, in my school. Uh, this is one of these ones you click through. Some of the things that I think are important there, though, really um, having supervision of an appropriate number. A lot of schools have a curriculum person that might look after 20 or 30 people. That's impossible. If you want that person to create change, there is a magic number. The military are pretty good with it, with their hierarchies. Um, six is about it. Business also not, does a lot in this field, but schools sadly are lacking. So a lot of staffing formulas in schools pay no attention to this. But that supervision and working with staff um, keeping them on track and coaching them is, is really important. So I try to have six, six to eight um, direct reports, making sure that we had a lot of consistency across the school, so important for students in particular, so they know what to expect. But you've got to balance that, I guess, with freedom. And I know that question came up um, in Sarah's presentation last week. What about, you know, what about how teachers want to do things? Well, I would always say your rooms, you're the personality in your room and, and let it be a reflection on your personality. But there are certain practices that we must have in every, in every room because they're proven to be the best, best practices and that consistency 
um, gives certainty for our students and um, allows them to pay attention more and learn more. And walk, walking around, feedback to teachers and using data to make decisions. So there are three of the things that, that I think um, are really important that I did. And knowing, knowing more as a leader of a school. I think your ceiling is your knowledge there. So if you don't know enough or you think you know enough, you think you know everything you need to know, there's a problem. You can always know more. High supervision, I've spoken about that. So change is difficult, does require will, skill, metacognition. Um, and you'll, the last point there, a lot of people will say that, um, unfortunately. That's very difficult. Some of the things my business I talk about um, with change management, there's some points around change. Nothing too earth shattering, I don't think, um, but I'll make a point of um, saying that um, trust halfway down. I, I said this to a leadership team I was working with the other day in a school that if you don't trust your staff, they won't trust you. So. You've got to give it to get it, um, and that can be difficult, but that, that's essential um, for any change to occur. You've got to have trust, and you've got to give trust to receive it from your staff. Um, and the last point there around being brave, when I brought the changes in at Broadbeach in 2014, there was an implementation dip a lot of people were um, initially happy to go along with it, then um, angry and um, a little bit disillusioned because they weren't getting instant results and they were probably working harder than they'd worked before for less results as that implementation dip occurred. And staying strong in that was very difficult at the time. In fact, I think if I could have... Um, headed for the hills I would have at the time, but I was too far, I was in too deep. So I had to stay the course and pretend at least to be brave. But I think that's a, a really important point. Some leadership tips. Um, the first one I spoke about before, knowing when to ask and when to tell. Um, that, that seems obvious, but it's so difficult. It's so nebulous. Uh, there's such a tight rope between that. And I say that because some people go too far one way or the other and the problem is um, a lot, often teachers like to be told. They, they don't want to be asked every single thing and then, then you'll find certain uh, occasions or topics where teachers want to be asked. They don't want you just to tell them what to do. So um, experience is a, is a great teacher in that, in that one as a leader but it is a very nebulous thing but a very important thing that I don't think enough education leaders understand. And the second one, um, to be a leader in education or in any field, I, I guess you need a, a fairly decent ego. Um, and it's important for everyone to have a decent ego in, in, in life. Um, the point here is when you're making decisions, try, try to exclude your ego. And I was always happy to rip something up and try again or say yep that didn't work if it meant that we were on the road to improvement so I, I, I think I was quite good at that I'm not saying I didn't have an ego um, or that you shouldn't have an ego but in terms of decision making I think that's incredibly important and the third point everything is political whether it be the price of a sandwich at the tuck shop um, to what you're doing in reading, uh, to where somebody sits in a meeting. Um, there's politics laden with everything. So as a naive leader, when I was a, I was a principal at 25 in a small school, um, I didn't understand that at all at 25. And I got burnt quite a lot um, because I didn't understand that. And I, I think knowing that there's politics, you might not know the extent of it, but being wary of politics is really important if you're leading a school. Um, and I think all the others 
so to speak, for themselves. All right. I think stuck again. I nearly finished anyway. I know we're all hungry. All right. Okay, that's um, my contact details. So if any of you would like to contact me either through LDA um, or through my business there, um, that's our website and LDA's website. Just bear in mind, LDA's website is under new construction. It's probably about two months off. Um, it will be a lot brighter. It will be a lot easier to use. If you're currently a member of LDA, it should alleviate most of the membership issues that, that have plagued us this year um, with the automated um, systems that will be in that website and in that database that's attached to that website. So. Uh, I'm working hard on that at the moment and, and looking forward to that um, being up and running. Uh, and there's my emails, both the, the Coglearn and the LDA emails. If you're a member, tell somebody about LDA. I think it's well worth joining. Um, and I think we're going to get bigger and better and stronger and more influential uh, to get this science of learning happening in more schools across Australia. Um, it is tax deductible. It's only $110 if you're not a member. Um, it's worth joining up. When we finally get to being able to have face-to-face -face conferences and we're looking at a national conference in January, um, the membership price will, will um, be worth it there just in terms of the discount that you will get to come to the, to the um, conference. So Alison Clark's up next week. And I'm sure she'll be much better at using Zoom and, and um, YouTube or anything else that, that I've mucked around with tonight. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to what she's got to talk about um, with English spelling has five kinds of log logic. And Alison's just rejoined council for LDA as well, um, which we're really uh, happy about as well. So we look forward to that.